Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Guy Dorsey with the Yellow Point Ecological Society and tonight it's our great privilege and delight to welcome Claudia Copley. Claudia has been a collection manager at the Royal BC Museum since 2004, where she's responsible for the entomology collection, which includes insects, arachnids and myriapods, a collection with more than half a million specimens. Her graduate degree was focused on the spider fauna of the ancient forests in the Carmano Valley, but her interests include everything biological. Every year during the summer field season, you'll find her exploring an area of British Columbia with collecting equipment in hand. Her current focus at the museum is an attempt to document BC's spider fauna, especially at high elevations. Tonight, Claudia wants us to go wild about gardening with wildlife. Claudia, the floor, the digital floor, the Zoom floor is all yours. It's so good to have you here. All right. Well, thank you. And thank you, everyone, for uh, coming. I appreciate the audience and that you kept your cameras on. That's nice. It's nice to uh, have faces to talk to. Um, I am, I just want to do a territorial acknowledgement, territory acknowledgement. I'm on the traditional territory and it's unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, specifically the Wasanic, because I live by Beaver Lake in uh, the Victoria area. And um, I wanted, I had a chat with, with Guy just before you guys all arrived about somebody who just, he was just laughing about people who are just getting interested in climate change and they consider themselves expert. And uh, and I was sort of laughing about that because the talk that I'm gonna to present to you tonight is a talk that I put together for Darren, my husband to give to the Knockin Hill, um, Friends of Knockin Hill Society more than a decade ago. And uh, he, when I met him, he was in the early nineties I met him and he was at that time giving talks like this. So, and it's not new even to us. Like, he, you know, he learned it from someone and we're still talking about it. So we march on and we carry on, we try to, <laughs> to spread the word. And the talk is billed as bees and butterflies and birds, but birds are really the gateway drug to wildlife gardening. So I will have a great emphasis on birds because most people, um, first come to really appreciate nature through flowers and birds. And uh, so that will be a, a high area of emphasis. And um, there's no time like 30 years ago to have started doing some of these things in your landscape. Uh, you can consider it decolonization. It can be something similar to, you know, the um, other truth and reconciliation acts that we do where we acknowledge traditional territory or we take uh, language out of documents that's offensive. Also decolonizing the land, removing the weeds, the English ivy, the Himalayan blackberry, that's a decolonization act as well and recolonizing with indigenous species. So that's what I'm gonna hopefully convey to you tonight. And uh, so I'm gonna share my screen with my talk and then um, I, th I think I'll be taking questions uh, from everyone at the end. Is that right, Guy? Yes. Okay. So keep your questions in mind or type them in the chat or something. I'm not sure how you'll do it. So, uh, and I do work at the museum and I do have a strong background in entomology. So I'm very happy to answer all your buggy questions after or any time, you can always contact me. I'm a public servant and I'm meant to answer your questions. Um, your servant, I work for you. Okay, so the fundamentals of caring for wildlife are exactly the same as caring for you. You need these things and wildlife needs these things. And it's pretty simple formula and it isn't actually that hard to accomplish in your landscape. So the first thing is, and if you were to do anything, the number one thing is to provide water in your landscape. And it can be um, simple or very elaborate. So again, starting with birds, they do need water to bathe. You know, we had those minus temperatures. I don't know how cold it got up island, but around here with the wind chill, it felt like about minus eight or 10. And I watched birds at our pond having a drink, which is the next slide, or having a bath in that chill. I couldn't believe that they would get into cold water and get covered in it in that cold temperature, but they did. I didn't even go outside, so I don't know what they were thinking. 
So birds and other wildlife definitely need it for bathing and for drinking. And as I said, it can be very simple, like a bird bath, make sure you provide some shallow areas and refresh the water frequently, or it can be more elaborate where there's a flow to the pond because that sound of water, if you create a pond that has the sound of running water, you will attract birds that you'd never expect to see in your yard. They'll hear the water sound and they'll come and have a bath and a drink. It also is a beautiful feature. It's more relaxing for you to have a nice sound like that. And just keep in mind too, this is a pond that we have in our front yard. So it's a bit bigger and maybe you don't have space for this, but maybe you do. There are some animals that need a pond, a wetland in order to complete their life cycle. So they can't finish being themselves and making more of themselves without a wetland at their uh, available, available to them. But I see people do things with bigger ponds that don't work very well for wildlife. So ponds shouldn't be too deep. They can have some deep areas, but they shouldn't be really deep. And they certainly can't have steep sides or hard sides. So don't put a, uh, a cement wall around them. Make sure they have natural vegetation on the edges and sloping sides so that animals can get in and out easily and uh, try to recreate riparian habitat around them. So we have mallards, western painted turtle, which is an endangered species here. And we do have wood ducks. That's a nest box for wood ducks on our pond. And uh, every year we get um, three pairs of wood ducks or two pairs of wood ducks and one pair of hooded mergansers using the nest boxes. Plus right now there's about 60 on the pond, wood ducks um, sort of mooching from, uh, from us because we feed them grain and they're very cute. So some other things that really require a pond and do not like a pond with a fish. So don't put fish in your pond. I'll tell you, I'll tell you that if you put fish in your pond, you basically eliminate all the aquatic insects and you might also eliminate having something like Pacific uh, tree frog, which needs your pond shallow areas, but will be have the eggs eaten by a fish. If you put fish in your pond, you'll create a great great blue heron feeder and an awesome raccoon habitat. And you will fight tooth and nail to maintain those fish. And it's not worth it because they're not really eating mosquitoes. They're eating the fish food that you put in there. So. Sometimes I get people worried about mosquitoes. If you have larval dragonflies, which is what's on the bottom of the screen below the dragonfly face, that's a larval damselfly, in fact, but they're a predator in their larval form. So dragonflies and damselflies as larvae and adults eat mosquitoes. So if you can encourage those things, you will have mosquito eaters. In the picture with the amphibian eggs, there's a diving beetle hanging on to a piece of vegetation there. Diving beetles are predaceous. All, all the things that eat mosquitoes will come and you will not have a problem with mosquitoes, I promise, in a balanced system. If you have a wet area and you can create some mud, you will be helping barn swallows, a federally endangered species now. People hear that and they're shocked because almost without exception, people my age and older, you've seen barn swallows, you think of them as numerous, and they are declining. They've declined 40% across their range. All they need is a little bit of mud and a place to build a little mud cup nest. And we can do that for them. And many people have heard of blue orchard bees or uh, some people call them mason bees. Same thing. This is a box that you can build for them, but see how they need a little bit of mud. And that's what they use to, to partition each of the eggs that are inside the um, long tube that's the hole. So they look remarkably like a fly. People forget that, and I'll get into bees a little bit more. They might not realize that this is a bee when they see it, but uh, this is a critical pollinator in our region for early pollination and on cold days because they fly at much cooler temperatures than honeybees, for instance. So they're really good at pollinating our fruit trees and things that are blooming when it can get a little bit still chilly. Mud is also awesome for butterflies. They like to puddle. So they come down and they stick their proboscis right into the mud and they uh, extract minerals from the mud. And this was a picture taken uh, in the Chilcotin of a bunch of butterflies puddling at a little mud puddle, swallowtails. 
So let's move to food now. And uh, I had to change this from the original slide I made for, for Darren for his talk for the Friends of Knockin' Hill because our food pyramid turned into this. So the federal government changed our, our pyramid and they changed it to this portions like this on a plate, but it's still the same principles apply. They need lots of fruit and vegetables. They need protein in whatever form. Most often that is insects, if you're birds, and then they need grains, which are seeds and things like that. So providing food for wildlife in our region, in your region, up island, arbutus berries are amazing fruit for, for birds. And these are some of the beauties that you will get when your arbutus is in full fruit. And, uh, and right now, probably a lot of people are seeing varied thrushes because they come around when it's chilly out. No one has seen a Western tanager, uh, certainly not an adult male like this picture because they are as far south as they can get to get away from us. Waxwings, we get cedar waxwing most commonly here and you may or may not be seeing them. They hang out in a big crowd. And I hope you are still seeing bantail pigeon. That is not a species we get very often here in Victoria anymore. When we first moved to our property, we used to have them at the feeder every day and now we never ever see them. So they are definitely on the decline. And some other fruits that you can grow in your garden that will attract wildlife. Uh, Saskatoon are famous, all the prairie people know them. You can eat them, of course. Oregon grape, you can also eat, but I wouldn't recommend it unless you're willing to add a lot of sugar. And um, what's now referred to as June plum or oso berry is, um, it tastes like sweet cucumber. I, I like it, but not everybody does. And these are all also really important for pollination. So the June berry is the earliest flowering shrub we have. This happens to be a male. And uh, you have to have a female if you wanna get plums. So you need a male and a female in your, in your landscape or somewhere nearby. The Oregon grape are really early bloomers as well. So hopefully they'll be out soon and provide something for our early bumblebee emergers. And depending on the type of habitat you have in your landscape, you can choose based on the water regime. So, you know, if you have a really dry landscape, you might choose hairy manzanita of these ericaceous shrubs. But if you had a really wet one, you might go with evergreen huckleberry. And then salal can probably handle either, although I do struggle to grow salal. Some people might not have any trouble, but I do. And you get to eat these if you're willing to share. So we, I pick from the garden. I pick from the wild harvest in our garden. I don't get as many as I want sometimes because the birds are pretty proactive and they'll eat them before they're really ready, which isn't fair, I don't think, but it's how it goes. And uh, some, of the, some of the other fruit eaters and uh, if you have some leftover fruit on your trees, you might get some of these woodpeckers. So red-breasted sapsucker also makes the holes in the tree that you can see below. They're not intending to kill the tree and uh, for the most part they don't. They're evenly spaced and they come back and they actually eat the sap that flows. And in the winter time, they're on cedar trees, which is what's shown here. And uh, they're in the um, summer when the sap is flowing and the deciduous trees, that's where they go. So some of the bloomers, if you plant some shrubs or low growing flowers, You'll get this beauty in your garden. These are gorgeous. No one can tell me that these are not beautiful flowers. They smell good in the case of the rose. And once you've got these growing, you're definitely gonna get some pollinators. So the solitary bees, which I will touch on uh, a little bit, butterflies of all kinds and um, bumblebees, which are social, but native social bees rather than honeybees, which are introduced. So let's talk about bees because this is a very popular topic. And I told you I made this slideshow for Darren, you know, a decade plus ago. I've added slides into it that are more relevant to the today and also more entomological. Bees in the world, there are about 20,000 species of bee, which is a remarkable number when people just like just absorb that for a second. And then think about this, in British Columbia, we have almost 500 species of bee. We're just shy of 500 species of bee, native, solitary for the most part bee. 
and most of them live in the South Okanagan because that is our driest, hottest area. But we do have a pretty decent fauna on Vancouver Island. I haven't heard a firm number, but I've heard people ref refer to about 150. And then I want you to look at the head, the picture. It's hard because I can't show it on the screen, but the picture with the bee, the little tiny bee, uh, just above the eye of the big bee. Now I want you to appreciate how diverse bees in North America because the xylocopa and the little Pertida minima, the little tiny bee on his eye, those are both adult sized bees that live in North America, the biggest and the smallest to get a sense of the diversity. And then look at the poster, you know, there are bees on there that you would swear were wasps. There are bees on there that people would think were flies. And the thing that unites bees, the thing that makes every bee a bee is that they have these hairs that have hair, which is what's indicated under the plumose hairs. So those two little round balls are pollen grains and they're stuck to some hair on a bee. So each one of the hairs of the bee has hairs and that makes them plumose hairs and the hairs on bees, even the very unhairy bees, like the ones that are look like wasps, wherever they have hair, they have hair that has plumes. So the hair has hairs, okay? That's what makes them bees. Now that's a very challenging feature to see in the, in the wild. So you can watch behavior and you can look for wings, two pairs of wings rather than one pair, which flies have an antenna to give you some other clues that you're looking at a bee. And then the other fact on this screen that I don't wanna to forget to mention is that 70% of our native bees are solitary ground nesters. In other words, a female bee burrows into the soil, lays eggs in chambers off the sides of the main burrow and provisions each egg with pollen. And that's it, that's all her effort. And the next summer, those bees come out of the soil and the whole cycle happens again. So they don't live in a hive. Bumblebees live in a hive and honeybees, which are not native, live in a hive, but all, almost all the bees live in the ground. So even the blue orchard bee, the mason bee, which lives in the burrow tunnels, that's unusual. That's part of the 30% that don't live in the ground. We know those ones very well and they're easier to manage. But if you wanna manage, if you want to encourage native bees in your landscape, you need to have ground that they can access. Landscape cloth, no, you can't live on that. You can't live in AstroTurf like they do in Langford. You can't do that. No bees can live there. They have to be able to burrow. And so they can't have a giant layer of bark mulch on top because they can't get through to the soil. So think about the bees when you're, when you're in your yard, think about leaving some bare patches and places that you haven't tilled frequently because that's where they're living. They need that habitat. And, you, and the only way to have them is to encourage them that way. So back to the flowers that we were talking about, after the bees or the butterflies, et cetera, have visited them, they produce seeds, and then you're gonna attract some of these little cuties. I think I'd like to surprise people with the goldfinch because the top photo is a female or a winter goldfinch, American goldfinch. So when you picture a goldfinch and you see the bright yellow, you're seeing a male in breeding plumage, but they often look quite drab. And then there's these sweet little chipping sparrows. Those are migratory. And uh, so they're all away right now, but they'll be coming back. And Savannah Sparrow, you can see them here in the winter. They're not as common in the winter, but they have that cute little yellow eyebrow. And they love to eat seeds, all kinds. And if you want any of these beauties, and don't we want these beauties in our landscape? These are all the neotropical migrant warblers. Every single one of these is an insect eater. So you cannot hope to have this beautiful array come to your landscape unless you're also willing to put up with some of this. So flies and spiders and bugs and beetles. Ugh! And then it gets even more interesting because really what those little insectivorous birds, all those beautiful colorful warblers want to eat for themselves and for every time they feed their baby and for almost every bird that you see out there feeding their babies, they wanna feed them caterpillars. 
And so I have this set of slides. I think Darren's taken all of these photos and I call this the Where's Waldo slide because everybody here is pretty cryptic, especially I think that one on the cedar. We took that at Yellow Point Lodge. We found that caterpillar when we were up there for the UVic course and it matches that cedar tree so perfectly, it's incredible. But if you're a warbler, that caterpillar is as big as a submarine sandwich to you. And if you are rummaging around in the bushes and you see that caterpillar, that is dinner. And it's dinner for your babies. So every baby mouthful is a caterpillar, almost without exception. So we need to put up with caterpillars because the birds need them. Plus, I'll get into this a little bit more. Well, I'll do it now. These turn into butterflies and moths, mostly moths, but still beautiful, and butterflies, which everybody loves. So this is the Where's Waldo slide. And I call this Priscilla Queen of the Desert slide because <laughs> these caterpillars are also important, but these ones are probably less palatable and they're not afraid to, they're not hiding. They're like, hello, I'm right here. Don't touch me because I don't taste that good. Two of these, the really beautiful orange and black and green one, and the one with the eyeballs on the top of its head are swallowtail larvae. So if you saw these and you freaked out and you squished them, you would be effectively wiping out swallowtail butterflies in your landscape. And I think you'd be disappointed by that decision if you learned it. So yeah, Priscilla, queen of the desert. So if I show you this slide of all these beautiful pinks and reds and tubular flowers, and I, you weren't all muted, I could ask you, you know, who do you think this, who do you think pollinates these? What? Maybe somebody should just mouth it to me. <laughs> okay, I'll leave you with your thoughts. I'm sure you're guessing. There you go. These are one of our um, two on the island area, hummingbirds, Rufus hummingbird and Anna's hummingbird. The Rufus is a migratory species. They overwinter in Mexico awesome right they're so lucky except they have to do that big flight twice a year and there's been one rufus hummingbird recaptured more than eight years in a row so they are long-lived little jobbies if given the chance they're not doing very well either there's serious declines in rufus hummingbird later i'll show you anna's hummingbird which is the one that spends the winter here and that one is doing very well so, and it's not really got anything to do with the rufus, but there might be a little bit of habitat competition. So if I show you these butterflies and I tell you what, I ask you, what plant, what plant would you plant for these five species, five species of butterflies? What's the best butterfly plant? And almost without exception at every event I've ever been at, butterfly bush, budlia. And the answer is no. Stinging nettle. So every one of these species has a caterpillar that eats stinging nettle. And so when we're talking about planting native plants, you're planting the host plant for the caterpillar. And the caterpillars are very particular, very fussy. And they like to eat usually just a, a set of different species, sometimes only one species. And if you don't have the host plant for the caterpillar, then you do not get the butterfly. And that is, well, with the singing nettle, you can get five species. So I'll just tell you that the red admiral and the painted lady are migratory species. So far, those two do not overwinter here. They do not occur except in the flight season, so the warm season, and they're coming from the south. And in the fall, the ones that are around die. They don't make it over winter, but that might change. We don't know. The West Coast Lady, the Anglewing and the Milbert's tortoiseshell are all year round residents. So they are they lay their eggs on the host plant, which is the stinging nettle. The caterpillars eat the stinging nettle and then another generation is produced here that overwinters. Now, even more interesting, I think is that the Milbert's tortoiseshell and the Anglewing overwinter as adult butterflies. So on a warm middle of the winter, like seriously, New Year's Day, you could see a Milbert's tortoiseshell flying around. And that's pretty amazing. There are a couple other species that overwinter too. Um, the morning cloak 
and oof, I'm gapping now, at least one more over winter as adults. So let's provide some shelter. The last thing we've done food and we've done water. So uh, really important to add layers to your landscape. And uh, I don't usually have to, you know, harp about this with gardeners because a flat boring landscape is just looks like this and is grim. In fact, this gives me heart palpitations just looking at these landscapes and then seeing a ride a mower. Whoa, that is over the top offensive to me. <laughs> I don't know why people like this have yards. I want them to live in condos, penthouses, penthouses of condos as far from the earth as possible because this is all you attract when you have a giant lawn like that. You get English house sparrows, European starlings or children, all terrible. <laughs> uh, so I will say, I just read, I just read an article that the house sparrow, even though it's introduced and it seems ubiquitous, is actually declining in North America now. So we can't even keep invasives alive with the way we've been, you know, stewarding the land. So something definitely needs to change. So my answer to this is that lawns are a four letter word and you should definitely get rid of all your lawn and maintain as much overstory structure as you can. And this is where size does matter. You hear people say that they're just gonna cut down that tree even though plant a little tree, but that little tree is gonna take hundreds of years to become as valuable as these massive overstory trees. They're critical to have providing that structure. And these are the, these are the, um, the final tree in the ecosystem here, the Douglas fir in certain habitats in the more forested areas and the Gary Oak in the more open areas. These are the climax trees in those ecosystems. And first off, you'll get some of these massive, beautiful, just, you know, show-stopping predators spending some time perching in those high trees. I've introduced you already to the pileated woodpecker, but there's hairy and downy, cute little cousins of each other. They just look so much alike. Their hairy woodpecker likes a bit more of a forest and the downy woodpecker prefers a Gary Oak ecosystem. They all three need a tree to make a nest in, to excavate a cavity and bring up a, a brood of young and then they abandon it. And that becomes really important for the next set of sweet suite of species that want to live in that abandoned bird house, bird cavity. So woodpeckers are really important in all of the ecosystems we talk about. Other tree lovers include the nuthatch and the brown creeper. The brown creeper below is showing where they nest. They need a, a loose piece of bark on a tree and you don't get that on a young tree. You need a big dead tree or a big live tree with lots of chunkiness to the bark in order to have a habitat that a brown creeper can actually build a nest in. And then I include a Pacific nine bark with the nuthatch because on many occasions, that lovely shrub, it's got gorgeous flowers, very popular with pollinators, but the bark gets peeled by the nuthatch and it'll do this to your grapevine too. It doesn't harm it, it just peels the loose bark and it builds a beautiful nest out of that material. Some more tree lovers from the heights in your yard, you'll see a couple of different um, finches. Uh, red crossbill, if you're very lucky, there seem to be quite a lot around right now. The, the bill is crossed to open seed bra or cone bracts to get at the seed in between. It's not a deformity, it's intentional. And then the pine siskin, there are just a ton around now in the feeders, and they are also a finch but they don't have the big crushing bill, so they have to work a little harder to get a seed open. Some shrubs, the next layer down. Willow, willow is really important for caterpillars. So if you wanna have a lot of submarine sandwiches in your yard, then definitely grow willow. They love alder and big leaf maple. Today I watched bush tits go to all the dry flower heads on my ocean spray right outside the window where I work just checking out everyone because there's sneaky spiders and other critters overwintering in those empty dead seed heads. And uh, the bush tits know about that. They just rummage right in there and get them out. So some sparrows for the ground. And uh, 
I hope I hope that some some of these birds are are new to you, but that you've seen them and you're like, oh, that's what that bird is. Um, right now, the golden crown sparrows do not look like that. In the winter time, they have a very reduced gold on the very top of their bill, and the black is is almost non-existent. But they'll get very fancy in not too long, and then they'll take off, and they're essentially replaced with the white crown sparrow, which isn't as common in the winter here. And the beautiful nest of the robin, they like to nest in shrubs and uh, and in crooks. So you'll, that's the most common nest I find, I think, because it's so big. And then the bush tit, which I just mentioned, if you find a dirty old sock hanging in a bush, that's a bush tit nest. And they, they put the eggs in the bottom, they have that opening at the top there. And so they go in there and there'll be a whole mess of birds deep in there and the whole thing will be moving like a sock puppet. Uh, they will reuse that nest. So don't tear it down if you can, leave it. And if they can rebuild it, they'll reuse it as it is, but otherwise they'll steal material from it because it's made of um, lichens and spider web and moss and um, cattail fluff. So there's a lot of work that goes into weaving that thing. And you can tell males and female bush tits apart by the color of their eye. So the male has a dark eye, which is what's illustrated in the solitary photo there. He has a nice dark eye. Male, four letters, dark, four letters. That's how I remember it. And then ground nesting species, the, the killdeers. If you ever get to see a killdeer near a nest, it's so neat how they pretend that they've got a broken wing to draw you away. So even surprisingly, something like a Pacific Slope flycatcher, which is always in the trees, actually nests on the ground, which is very bizarre. And people get pretty riled up about moss. And I'm never sure why that is, but the chickadee loves moss. And I have a nest that I'll show you. Oh, I might be able to show you. Can I show you now? Yes. Okay. I have this little nest of a chickadee and it's there's even some eggs in it because it was abandoned, uh, but it's all moss. So that's like three inches. We'll go, we won't use metric moss. So that's a moss lover. So you should uh, forgive the moss in your lawn, just leave it be. And also, because you don't have a lawn, uh, also salamanders. All the um, amphibians really need moss moisture. It holds the moisture in a lot better. And even the lichen, people are like, lichen, who cares about that? Well, tell that to the Anna's hummingbird or the Rufus hummingbird. Their entire nest is covered in lichen so that it hides, it's more camouflaged on the branch. It's also got a lot of moss in it. It's held together by spider webs. So another reason to love spiders. And you can make a rock pile, that's pretty easy and you'll attract northern alligator lizards, I hope, and uh, snakes. So they like a nice warm spot. I used to have a soundtrack for this, but nobody knows this show anymore. But this is an important component of your, of your nature scape. And it's this, what I mean by deadwood. So there's gonna be a test at the end. I'm gonna give you a quick flash of something and you gotta memorize it. And then at the end, I'm gonna quiz you what I'm going to flash you are all the species that depend on a wildlife tree, a dead or dying tree, all the bird species in British Columbia. You ready? Yep. Okay. Oh Memorize it quick. <laughs> it's quite a long list. Uh, it, without a dead or dying tree with abandoned woodpecker holes, these species cannot live here. So don't be so quick to cut down a dead tree. If it's not gonna land on the house, it's not gonna kill a neighbor that you like, don't cut it down, leave it be and let it fall on its own when time, when it eventually gets to that point and then leave it on the ground. Because if you don't, you have to put up nest boxes to substitute for those dead and dying trees. So that's what's happening when you put up a birdhouse. You're replacing an abandoned woodpecker nest. And it's a lot more work. You've got to clean it, you got to install it. It's a hassle. Also, same for bats. Bats are critical in our ecosystem. They're really magical at eating mosquitoes. If people hate mosquitoes, bats do great damage on mosquito populations. So leave a dead and drying tree. If you, if you have to cut it down or if it falls down, leave it where it is because it will fill with invertebrates 
including things like termites and the woodpeckers, everybody's gonna move into that log. Nature does it, you should do it. Always emulate nature. So nature does not clean up. Nature does not tidy. You can add coarse woody debris to your landscape. There's Darren, look how young he is. That's a weird picture for the people in the audience who know him. Yes. <laughs> so he's adding wood to a landscaping project because it needs it. It doesn't have any and it was just incomplete without it. And the Western redback salamanders will thank us. They love wood. They love living in it and under it. Very simple project, branch pile. So you're you're, tr you're pruning your fruit trees, put the branches in a pile. Don't burn them, please don't burn them. That is terrible and it's terrible for the soil below. Eventually you have to do something else with your branch pile probably, but in the meantime, over winter, if you pre create a branch pile like this with tidying from winter, you know, blowdowns or whatever, the first thing's gonna happen is you're gonna get, the very first thing's gonna happen is a Pacific Wren is gonna move into that pile. They cannot resist it. It's just like a magnet for them. And if you're lucky, I hope you'll still have quail in your neighborhood, even though they're introduced, super cute. They like a good branch pile too. And then when the spring comes and the migrants come back, you'll get uh, something like this house wren who's also, see how he's eating a submarine sandwich right there. <laughs> Look at this nest, this stick nest. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes, yes. Look at all those sticks. Those, this house wren, they love sticks. So stop cleaning up sticks in your yard because the house wren needs them. And a lot of other birds need them for their nests too. So I'm just gonna remind you about the overwintering sites. I mentioned the butterflies. When you put up one of those silly little butterfly houses, you're emulating a standing dead tree. That's what they, what you're pretending to put up because that's where the overwintering butterflies are. Underneath logs is a really sheltered spot when it's been cold, we have a lot of snow. Those are great spots for them. And leaves, leave the leaves. Don't rake them, don't burn them. You can mulch them, but don't chew them up because then they're, for instance, there's a butterfly called the Propertius dusky wing that eats um, gary oak and they overwinter in a curled up dead gary oak leaf. So if you take away all the gary oak leaves every year uh, from underneath your gary oak, then you're basically killing every Propertius dusky wing that's gonna come out the next year, you're removing them all. And if you mulch them, you're chewing them up into, mit, into bits. So just move the leaves off the places you don't want them and put them in other areas where who's ever living in them will still survive. This is just a fun component, it's not essential, but it is pretty fun to provide nest materials. So if you have any animals in your life, it doesn't have to be yours, it can be your neighbors. It sounds like you have a lot of farmers in your neighborhood, Guy. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully you have some wildlife uh, using them. Chickadees, I showed you the nest of the chickadee at the very top. After all the moss, they use hair. And so does the Buick wren. although the Buick wren will use anything they find in addition to the moss and the hair and the sticks. They love all kinds of weird things. And then if you have chickens in your life or anyone nearby, the swallows adore the feathers and anyone who's been uh, with us at Yellow Point, you can take a feather and blow it up into the air and the swallows will come and they'll get so riled up to take the feather back to their nest that they will actually take them right from your hand and they'll fight over them. It's amazing chicken feathers or duck feathers for lining their nest. So we're getting near the end now. All I'd like you to think about is this is terrible. This landscaping here, this is in the Victoria region. It's bare naked mountain. And this means that there's no habitat joining those two little green spaces. If you're wildlife and you're trying to make your way between those places, there's no stopover, there's no place to forage. There's just that horrible four letter word lawn. Please try to create some connectivity between these landscapes, the protected areas and the wild places need our help for animals to be able to traverse this habitat and for them to find places to live. And your landscape needs to be pesticide free. If you don't want 
to harm things in your landscape. Don't use pesticides. Don't buy products that have pesticides uh, like neonicotinoids right into the tissue. Bees collect the pollen. Pollen is a plant tissue. If neonicotinoids are in the tissue of the plant and they're in the pollen, that bee takes that pollen and it feeds its baby that pollen. So that is a direct transmission of a poison to their baby. And if we're wondering why bees are declining, not just honeybee, but bees in general, that is one of the reasons is because neonicotinoids and choose organically grown. Even if um, you're not particularly fussed about your own health, you can think of how it's produced. And if you choose organically grown, you know it has less impact in the place that they are growing it because they're making choices on how to manage the soil and not use poisons all the time. And then be less of a neat freak. Do what mother nature does. If it falls from a tree and lands on the ground below it, leave her be. That's what is supposed to happen. Something needs it to be there. So don't be too spazzy like this guy. He looks pretty stressed out actually. <laughs> I haven't looked at his face for a long time. He looks pretty stressed. And then if you have cats, I am a crazy cat lady and I married one too, because Darren loves crazy cat ladies and cats too. These are our cats. They're very content. They've lived inside their whole lives and uh, they don't seem to mind. Uh, it looks pretty easy. We don't have a fire. We don't use a fireplace anymore because we have a heat pump. So they're probably a bit disappointed that there's no fireplace, but otherwise they're pretty content. Remember to see yourself in the landscape. This isn't just a wild, crazy, weird garden that you can't go in because it's so impenetrable. This is our front yard. You know, we have a seating area and an area where we grow um, vegetables and propagate plants and pot up. But we also have, you know, a blue orchard bee box and a pond and a wood duck box and native vegetation all around so that we're accommodating ourselves, but other things too. And then uh, finally, this the Naturescape um, is a principle that was put forward by the provincial government. And they had this poster where they had a little wren nesting in a glove. And they said, all you need is a little space. And <laughs> Darren has his work, his tool belt hanging in the shop and wrens have nested in it more, more than a few times. And then he has the excuse that he can't do any work. But this is a little family of Buick wrens nesting in his tool belt in the workshop. And I think there were five in there, which is pretty amazing. So you don't need much room. And I'm ready uh, to take questions now. That's just wonderful, Claudia. If you want to stop sharing, we can see all our human all right. pictures here. Um, well, well, I, I'm going to ask Nikki if she wants to sort of scan through the chat box and bring some questions up. But while she's doing that, and Doug Talman, who's the East Coast of America specialist in this stuff, he says that a chickadee, during when it's raising its young, needs 6,500 caterpillars during a four-week period or something. Is the, is the same kind of numbers true out here? Yeah, that would definitely be like that. I mean, a chickadee has four or five young, and they're hungry all day. And so they're just nonstop. We've had cameras in the nest boxes and watched them coming and going. And they have this, <laughs> they're quite synchronized. The chickadee arrives, male or female, because I think both are helping. They arrive with the submarine sandwich, saw, you know, the, the caterpillar, and they put it in an open mouth. And one of the chicks poops and they take away the fecal sac. Oh. <laughs> so it's like in, out in, out, all day long. And it's just incredible how many times I have to do it. So Nikki, what have we got in the question box? Uh, do people want to unmute and ask their own question? I think the first question yeah. here is from Jay Perrin on uh, bumblebees and chickadee boxes. I don't know if- Oh yeah, that's a um, question. Jay, can I you- I have bumblebees that take yeah, up that, my that, chickadee that box. That was me, that was yeah. me. Uh, we had a uh, bumblebee more than one year at the, the a very fuzzy uh, lemon yellow and almost a honey colored bumblebee and chickadees would start nesting in the nesting box. And then at about, oh, uh, sometime in early April or, or mid April along would come the bumblebees and, and oust the, the chickadee and build a nest in there that when I pulled it out this year, it was really a thick uh, 
uh, kind of gooey, not gooey, a really thick, strong kind of structure they'd built in there. And they actually kicked the chickadee out. And another year when I removed the uh, bumblebee nest, underneath was the chickadee nest with three eggs in it. And they had, they had evicted the, bumble, the chickadee and just built right over uh, what they were doing. So I wonder if you knew what kind of bumblebee that would be, uh, Claudia. Yeah, I can I can answer your I can answer your bumblebee question. It's um, Bombus melanopygus, which is like the black tailed bumblebee or something. It's our oh, good, it's the species that's right I thought it was. Yeah, it's the species around here that often uses um, bird nests because bumblebees don't make their own nest material. They don't bring in moss and things like that. They need to find an, a nice insulating material that's already there. So they'll use an abandoned bird nest like that in a nest cavity, like your birdhouse, or more typically they nest underground because there are 70% of bees nest under, underground. They nest in an abandoned rodent burrow or a rabbit burrow because both rabbits and rodents make a nice soft nest to nest in. So bumblebees will move into that. Now I'll say a couple things about I think at this point, a bumblebee is worth as much as a chickadee in terms of worrying about rarity and who should live. So I wouldn't clean out a bumblebee nest. I would be glad you had it if you find that happens again. And oh no, I don't do it till way at the end of the season. Yeah, I have okay. to dodge them all summer long because yeah. well, they, they usually finish by the 1st of July, but they'd actually chase me when I if I clump oh, yeah. up the back steps too loudly. I had to be careful. Sure. Yeah, you have to sometimes when you get too close to a nest. And then the other thing I think those chickadees probably went on and found another spot and and brought up a, a nest somewhere else. Chickadees are secondary cavity nesters. So they actually can in a dead, a quite dead tree, excavate their own cavity. So they don't necessarily have to find a woodpecker, abandoned woodpecker tree nest. Well, they actually use the, uh, the second chickadee box and, and we're quite successful there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. good. Oh, for sure good. Uh, we, we have yeah. multiple questions. Nikki, who's next? Uh, next, next question is, is from Pamela. Pamela Walker is asking about tent caterpillars. Pamela, you want to unmute and ask? Oh, I was just wondering if, if there are any birds that do eat the tent caterpillars and whether we should leave those in our trees or, or not. Okay, uh, so tent caterpillars are native to the region, and um, I only I only take issue with them when they get into a fruit tree, because my fruit trees are pretty small, and I don't really want them completely denuded, and so I just cut out the branch and then stomp all over them. I've offered them to my chickens, and they will not eat them, but I have heard that northern flicker will eat them. I've never seen it myself, but I've heard that they will, but generally... Tent caterpillars are controlled by tachinid flies, which are a parasitic fly. And if you find a tent caterpillar that has a little white blob on it, usually on its head, but somewhere on its body, that's an egg from a parasitic fly. So don't kill that one because it's dead man walking anyway, and it'll make more flies, which will kill more tent caterpillars. So when we actually have three species of tent caterpillar, caterpillar in British Columbia, and um, and yeah, they are fine. Like if they're in a if they're in a a tree in your yard, like a cottonwood tree or something, who cares? They're not going to do any damage. They just don't get to the numbers that matter. Okay. Nikki, who's next? Nice? And Marshall and Donna, did you want to ask extra questions about the tent caterpillars? You need to unmute. Okay, there we go. That answers okay. my question. We're on the same wavelength, Pamela. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How about we ask about your hedgerow question? Okay, what jump the queue, go rows? for it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I was wondering whether you could talk about hedgerows. Yes, I love hedgerows and so do wildlife. They're incredible. So that is, that is the nicest thing to put between you and your neighbor is a beautiful mixture of shrubs, native, native shrubs and trees. And, uh, and of course, site specific. So if it's a wet area, you know, choose something that likes to live in a damp spot, but otherwise mix it up quite a bit. And uh, it will be a bit of maintenance with the trimming so that you can get by it because, you know, our native plants are perfectly adapted to living here. So they grow well, they don't need to be babied, they don't need to be wrapped like a palm tree. But um, it will attract so much wildlife because there'll be all the pollinators and all the uh, submarine sandwich um, caterpillars, and then all the birds that will come and check it out. 
Thanks, Nikki. Great. Kelly, Kelly Brockman wanted to ask about attracting amphibians looking for a prince. Do you want to unmute me, Kelly? Yes. Um, so I'm planning on building a, a wildlife pond in our backyard here, but we, were, we live on Lake Quinell. But I can't seem to find salamanders anywhere, like wherever I look. Um, and I was wondering if there's a certain way I can get them to come to this new wildlife pond I'm building. Well, a bunch of the salamanders are lungless and they don't live in the water at all. So they're under coarse woody debris in the forest and they breathe through their skin. And so they don't need to come to your pond to breed. They'll lay eggs in the damp wood in the forest. So you, you know, you have to pay attention to what species occur in your region. Did you say Lake Quinell as in near Quinell? Yeah, we're right next to Wildwood Eagle Forest. Quinell Lake. Oh, been... oh up, up on the island. Okay, okay, good. So, so in your woods up there, you should get red, Western Redback Salamander and those will never come to your pond, but you might get Northwestern and that's the big black brown ones. And they do breed in the pond. And then the rough skin newt, which have the rough skin and the orange belly. And you might be surprised that you don't see them. And also long-toed salamander. You might be surprised you don't see them, but they might still come. So it's kind of like that movie, if you build it, they will come. You know, you'll be surprised at what you'll find in your, in your pond after a few years, but make sure you have some shade, riparian vegetation, access, put a log in it. So things have somewhere to crawl out or hide under, you know, just try to emulate nature as much as you can. Um, I will say that we've lived on this, on this property, we've, we have revegetated it from a horse field and um, we've been here more than 25 years now. And last year for the first and only time I found um, a long toed salamander, the one with the yellow on the back in our yard. And I was just, my mind went, because I've never seen one anywhere nearby. I never would have thought that they were here. I was very excited. Yeah. <laughs> Next we have um, Jim, uh, 211 Jim has a question. Thank you. And, and thank you, Claudia and, and Guy for putting on this, is, this on. This is absolutely fantastic. Um, I live in a condo on five acres and about 25% of it is is wildlife habitat uh, most mm. a lot of it unru overrun with blackberries but we've done a lot of work about removing the blackberries but uh, I, I have a question about building paths through it uh, this this uh, piece of greenery or wildlife habitat runs down one side of the property and it's it's long not too wide maybe maybe 60 feet 50 feet wide and and and, and some people I was wondering if you had any comments about building a, a path right through them the middle of it or, or it, can that be done without interfering with the habitat or would it be better to encourage people to enjoy the what's there from from walking along the edge i wonder if you had any comments about that claudia i would i would um if it were if i was in charge i wouldn't divide the habitat by the path even though it's nicer for people because it does in effect divide the habitat and reduces the sanctuary effect that it has for wildlife so it just gives animals more, sh more places to be farther away from people by having less paths, less access. And so the more trails and things we build, the nicer it is for us, but it's not great for wildlife and you'll see less and less of things. And we don't even know exactly who will impact. They just won't be there anymore. We'll just, they'll just be lost from that habitat. Um, you could, put the path to one edge and then plant a hedgerow so that there was still that, uh, that feeling of being engulfed by nature, but not actually having this massive path down the middle, rather it's all over to one side. And then you can just do a hedgerow to, to provide that sort of effect of surrounded by nature. That's there, what I would recommend. Is there a Thank balance? Very much. Claudia, is there a balance in as far as we want other humans to fall in love with nature by being in it and observing it. So we know with old growth forests, the best way to get people to love it is have a trail through it. If a little path is just like a little winding deer trail, is that okay or still best not? Well, if you have a choice, it's better not. And you know, when they did like, for instance, Avatar Grove, when they discovered Avatar Grove and they started encouraging people to go there, then they loved it to death. 
and they had to put in a boardwalk. And that was a big expense, but it was really worthwhile because it, of course, reduced the damage to the roots and things. So if you just think about the long-term impact, it we, we build it with, you know, just the eight people we think will use it. But as soon as you build it, then all the people come and then the dogs come and you've effectively divided that habitat in half by putting a trail right through the middle of it, especially if you make it all windy and charming, because then it's just covering all the ground. So Nikki, who's next? Next up is uh, Susanna Michaelis to ask about dragonflies. Uh, yeah, hi. So we have a natural pond out in the front. It used to be fairly seasonal and we've been uh, removing um, bulrushes and making it a bit deeper. Uh, I'm not, we don't know the effect yet because uh, we haven't gone through a whole year with the pond deeper. Um, and it is a, a tree frog um, habitat. They reproduce in large numbers. Good. So uh, I was wondering about mosquitoes. We're trying to attract dragonflies. What would be an attractant? One of the questions is, do we need lily pads for they, them to land on? And another question is, there are ponds like um, Buttertub's Marsh, I see turtles. Uh, is, are those little turtles something we should try and have as well? Um, okay, well, let's deal with dragonflies first. So not too deep for basically everything, not too deep. And cattails are, like you said bulrushes, but I think you mean cattails, right? Probably. Uh, yeah, and so cattails, that fluff, that is in every nest of every bird you see. Like that, I uh, you'll watch things. Don't take that out if you can. Leave as much of that as you can. Because uh, can so... I just say the pond was getting almost full. Yeah, that's... that's right. So you might have had to just make a place where there's still some open water, and uh, so you have emergent vegetation with the with the cattails, and that's perfect for dragonflies because they like to climb out to do their last molt where they're a larva and then they come out and they emerge with their wings. They need upright vegetation for that usually. So that's good that you have that. And any other sedges and rushes that you can plant in there are also good. Make sure you have some shallow areas still because they need the warmth, but they have to be deep enough that they can swim to safety. And that's true for the tree frogs too, because of course a heron will eat a tree frog or whatever. Uh, you know, predators will come. So they have to have places they can tuck under. So add a log. You can add pond lilies if you want, but they really do require quite a lot of depth. If you've ever seen a native pond lilies root, it's, well, it's their stem. It's just the most incredible weird thing. It looks like a, like a dinosaur tail or a dragon tail. Um, they, they tend to need deeper water. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about that. Thanks. And then um, what was the other question was about turtles. Uh, turtles. I see turtles at Buttertub's Marsh. Um, is that a native thing? That Are they supposed well, to be in ponds? Well, they're on the island we have um, western painted turtle, which is an endangered species. Um, we also unfortunately have a lot of red-eared sliders, which are an invasive. They're up from the pet trade and people have released them. And they used to not reproduce here, but they're getting like literally seconds away from being successful reproducing here because it's getting warmer. And so they get enough degree days to successfully raise a clutch. Um, but even so they're pretty long lived as most turtles are. So you should try to find out two things. First of all, are they native? Are they Western painted turtle at Buttertub's Marsh? And if they are, are you close enough for them to come to you? Because if they are, if you're close enough to Buttertub's, or other ponds that have them, then you'll get them on your own. And a log is all you need in your pond, just something for them to come out and sun on. Oh, great, thanks. Okay. Great, thanks. Next next up, uh, Joan, Joan and or Bruce to ask about uh, wasps. Wasps. Wasps, trapping wasps. Yeah, are there any redeeming qualities for wasps? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Every year in the fall, I have to go on the radio and answer this question. Um, I say definitely yes, but the, there is a time of year when wasps become troublesome, but for the most part, wasps are predators. So they're really beneficial in your landscape because they feed their larva meat, you know, where the bees collect pollen and they feed their larva pollen the wasps go out and get insects and feed the insects 
to their larva. So that's hunting in your garden, killing caterpillars, killing everything that, you know, is an insect and adding it, adding it to their hive. In the fall, when the queen dies and food becomes scarce and the colony is big, things get a bit problematic. So you end up with wasps that are pestering you at your barbecue. Uh, I would say that the most common species of wasps at your barbecue are actually invasive. And um, the ones that are doing good work in your garden are native, like the bald-faced hornet, that sort of thing. So, so part B of that question would be, um, where, is it okay, when they start to eat your food, like you're mm -hmm. sitting outdoors and they want your food, is it okay to be trapping them or would you be still trapping native ones at the point at which they well the, the traps are you trapper, yeah the, too, the traps right? they like salmon way more than they like vegetables it seems and so yeah they're meat eaters for sure and right. so you can um distract them from where you are with a piece like the salmon skin you know the part you might not eat but you, yeah. or the head or the head of the salmon you could just lay that out somewhere and they'll go to that but you are going to probably be bothered by wasps if you're eating barbecued meat outside, yeah. almost without a without a fail in the August when the nests are really the hive is big and they have a lot of babies in there and they really want to take care of them, then they do definitely come to your barbecue. And okay. if you use one of those sugar traps, um, sugar water traps or pop, you know whatever people put in them, they that does catch a lot of native species too. Okay. It's not going to, you're not going to reduce the population to the point where we're all going to worry. Mm. We just usually switch to eating inside, but, but we'd rather be able to still eat outside. So. Yeah, vegetarian meals. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't wear we stripy to socks. To food a beast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, next one, um, just skipping one because there's a long one and then there's a short one. So Marshall and Donna wanted to ask about uh, Oregon juncos. Hmm? Um, this is really, really wonderful. Thank you, Guy, and thank you, Claudia. It's really helpful. Um, what do Oregon juncos eat? Like what kind of seeds or, and, and then I have another question about the wasps that just came up from that past one. Okay, uh, so, um, Oregon junco is a form of the dark-eyed junco. The proper, the proper name is the dark-eyed junco. And they are seed eaters. And so if you have a bird feeder, they will come to your bird feeder. We are only feeding black oil sunflower seeds. So they're eating that. But at our chickens where I put out grain, they eat the grain too. So, uh, and they can be fed with Milo, white Milo millet. They will eat that. So those are options if you want to feed them. But in your landscape, they eat the seeds. So I watch them and they're eating a lot of Douglas fir seeds right now because there's such a big seed production year last year. And uh, any other seeds that they can get on, they're usually on the ground. And that's, so they're just finding seeds, dandelion, anything like that they'll eat. But when they feed their young, they feed them insects, submarine sandwiches. I'm going to swap. You just reminded me of something about the Douglas fir cones. Um, I'll swap out my other question because I don't want to take too much time. But we have this gray squirrel right now this year, first time ever in 30, 20 some odd years, that is going up the trees and like just dropping like grenades all everywhere you go, all over our property. And we've just got like hundreds and they'll get up and they'll eat half and then they'll drop a whole bunch more. I've never seen that before. And is it is it a gray squirrel? Because that's really unusual. But we have red squirrels again where we live at Beaver Lake. After many many years, they they're making a bit of a comeback, and uh, they do that and they drop them on our metal roof from our yes. Douglas fir tree. Oh wow, it is loud. Yeah. <laughs> by uh, they, it's just like a rainstorm of yeah that's right and so i would be very surprised if it was gray squirrel which are an introduced species for anyone who might not know that but but i because there's black and i haven't seen any red at all but they're all oh it's seen that that's a dead hint that you have a red squirrel check more carefully because okay. gray squirrels are deciduous forest squirrels that's why they love living where we have Gary Oaks because they they like acorns and things like that. They're not as much of a conifer 
forest species, okay. which is why they sort of haven't made it to the west coast. Okay. How would a gray squirrel and a red squirrel differ in color? Well, uh, red squirrels are, are like a half of the size or even a third the size. And then they're a really warm chestnut rufousy red. Okay. Ours no. is kind of silver. Silver, <clears throat> big, big plumy tail. It huh. looks about the same size as the black squirrel we have. Yeah, sounds like a gray squirrel. Weird. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's weird. <laughs> we don't want that adapting to conifers. Uh, next up, uh, Carrie Lee, do you want to ask? Um, you don't want that. Is that don't want at least that. two of your questions. <laughs> <laughs> They're relatively quick. So um, okay. it's, it's about the barn swallow. And when I was looking at the slide and she said, all we, all we need is mud. But the what it looked like was they were building it on a building. Is that correct? Is there some way to encourage them to build not on your building? Uh, or is that they, just sort they, of... They, they do tend to use rafters and things like that in an old barn or yeah they do and garages or carports they like those um there is a design for a swallow a barn swallow shelf that you can install and then they can nest on the shelf rather than and but that tends to be attached to a structure again like your house or something and, and then the one about bees is um, just clarify, how, how do you identify a bee? Did you, about the wings? Did you say they had two sets of wings? Yeah, so um, there are many flies that work very hard to look like a bee. And the flies only have one set of wings. And then their antenna are usually very short and very tiny and really not noticeable. And bees have quite prominent antenna. And then they actually have two sets of wings. But it's hard to see the second set of wings because the front and hind wing are hooked together and they act as one. So it's quite tricky. OK. And, and the, in the picture about the bats, you had the bat houses. So I, I like. I know I like bats. I know bats eat mosquitoes and things like that. So um, is there another way to track them? Or well, um, a, a wetland, having a pond is a, it will definitely attract bats because they forage a lot over water. And uh, so if you live near a waterway or a, like a gently flowing waterway or a wetland and um, they like really old trees in the deep furrows of the bark of a Douglas fir tree. They might be roosting in there. And um, some of them will use, a few species will use the, the attic sort of structure of a building, which you may or may not want, uh, depending on, you know, what kind of building it is. And, um, and yeah, just having open areas that they can fly relatively unimpeded but also native vegetation like you see them uh, foraging around the crowns of of conifer trees a lot that's that's pretty typical because there's a lot of insects that are coming off of the tree in the evening and uh, and then over wetlands those are the places i've seen bats most often mm. the last one's a quick one about aphids are they natural here do we have aphids here or are they introduced and is we have we have both we have native and invasive aphids i have to admit i don't know much about them but i will tell you this when anybody asks me about aphids i say well decide first of all is this something that is this a battle i need to fight because most often you know there are other problems with the plant if it has aphids and in the case of like in your garden if you grow um broad beans and you get all those black aphids near the tip i've dealt with them and i've not dealt with them and it makes no difference to the crop so sometimes it's just not a battle you need to fight and if you really don't want to even look at them you just spray them with your hose and they're gone cool nikki <laughs> well, a few more questions um but i'll go to jane who hasn't yet asked a question that'd be jane jane roma jane wants to ask about sap suckers if she's still with us are you here, Jane? Okay. Cats are getting up to mischief. <laughs> so I'm just gonna ask, ask uh, Jane. Jane, are you there? Hey. You're muted, Jane. 
Okay. He's unmuted. We're playing telephone tag. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, she's unmuted, but can't hear her. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Jane. I think your keyboard uh, is muted. Your own keyboard. The was audio is not working. Um, I think so. The I'll try and just read the question then. For her, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so for Jane, the sapsuckers are attacking her mountain ash tree to the extent it's barely alive. Um, are there any other food sources to distract them? And she's, she's, she's also seen the arbutus trees covered with them. Sapsucker wells on an arbutus tree? Yeah, that's sapsucker hole. Yeah. Oh, I've never seen that. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, arbutus wood is really, like it's very hard, very dense. So it's hard for birds to poke into. Yeah. But um, every now and then a tree is so delicious that there's just no escaping the sap suckers persistence. And I'm sorry, but occasionally they do kill a tree. And it's often an ornamental tree, often a cherry. Uh, ornamental cherries are really vulnerable. Um, you can wrap the tree if, you know, if there's an area that they keep coming back to and poking, but it probably isn't a battle worth fighting. Um, they come to cottonwoods and what else have I seen them on? Maples. So if you can plant some trees with some more girth to them and that grow quickly and produce quite a girth, then you won't have that vulnerability because the mountain ash is a much narrower tree, there's smaller stem and it just is a lot more vulnerable to the, all those holes. So I, I, can't, I can't stop your sap sucker, um, but you could I'm give back. it, I would give it uh -huh. maple. I can't hear you now, Oops, sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah, anyways, I couldn't hear any of your answer because my volume got messed up. I could just see your mouth moving. But, um, It'll be recorded, uh, Jane. You can catch it later. Yes, I'll watch it later. Um, and so, ask your next question about the night hook. Yeah, it just they 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 and the wasp have basically attacked my entire tree, so it's just ringed like from bottom to top. And I try mm -hmm. rags around it and paper and all sorts of things to try to save it. But um, yes, I know they are very persistent. Yeah, you're going to have to have a ceremony for that tree, a farewell ceremony. So. Yeah, <laughs> and then I, I had asked about arbutus. I just thought that was unusual to see them on arbutus trees. It's very but, unusual. I've never heard of that. No, I can't think of anything else it would be because it's the same characteristic. Little yeah, little yeah it's very that. odd. Yeah. Okay, thank and, you. And you're welcome. Jane, did you want to ask about the nighthawks while you're... Oh, she's fine again. <laughs> I muted Jane. You have to unmute yourself again. Okay. Yeah, I used to have night hawks. Well, not me, but they were at when my parents lived by Quinell Lake. And they were in our yard. You know, we I'd stand in my window at dusk and watch them dive down. And um, they're just the most amazing birds. And I saw two a couple of years ago, way out in the bush, but I really haven't seen them in 20 years or more. And I just wonder if what the status of them is these days. Is the status of uh, night hawks and actually aerial insectivore birds in general. So barn swallows fall into that category and night hawks they are just crashing, their populations are crashing. And um, it's not that hard to attribute that in part to, there hasn't been a direct correlation, but I think we can kind of get, we can just use common sense. There is what's called the insect apocalypse where insect populations are crashing. You remember you used to drive and the windshield would be covered with dead insect splatters and now you drive and you don't get any moth populations, flying insects, nighttime especially like I remember night hawks when I was a child at the at the lights the street lights and all the moths and you just don't see that anymore it just does not happen because we've lost the habitat that supports populations of insects and insects support populations of birds particularly right. aerial insectivores so they're on our federal endangered species list as well 
Okay, that makes so much sense. I just yeah. didn't really put that together. And, but, and they're yeah. a ground nesting bird too. So they're really vulnerable to habitat mm -hmm. loss and predators like outdoor cats. So. Right, yeah. Okay, interesting, thanks. You're welcome. Guy, what do we have time for? One or two We've got more? Another, another 10 minutes if we finish at 8.30. Okay. Uh, Pamela, do you want to ask about the carpenter ants? Mute. <laughs> Sorry, we live in that forest, so obviously we do have carpenter ants, which is fine, except when they come into the house. Mm -hmm. I agree. Sometimes they come into my house, and I don't think it's fine either. So um, carpenter ants, this isn't a 100% all the time situation, but in general, carpenter ants only will enter your home where you have wood touching soil because they like damp wood and they don't come through a concrete like they won't generally go through a concrete divide so if you have good footings on your house and you've made sure that there's no soil piled up against your house you really shouldn't get carpenter ants okay um, but if you do if you have any ant in the house um, the strategy that I have employed is a nine to one corn syrup borax mixture so the borax is the small amount and you, you keep it moist. So you have to reapply and you put it near where you think they're coming in. And uh, so you have to re-dab, freshen the, the syrup, essentially, keep it in a sealed container and refresh it. And it won't happen overnight, but they will take that delicious syrup back with the borax and the colony will be killed by the borax, but it does take a while. Like it's a couple weeks probably, but it's effective. It does it does stop the, or, you know the. Is there any birds in particular that like to eat them that we could encourage in the yard? Sure, the only bird that I know of that eats ants in our region is the northern flicker, and they oh. really will rip apart an ant nest, especially a thatch ant nest and just tear into it and really go to town. But I will tell you another cool thing, it's got nothing to do with eating, but just within the last two weeks, Darren and I saw a whole huge flock of robins coming down to a fat ant nest, one of those big mounds of ants and anting. So they put their body on the nest and the ants climb all over it to eat the parasites that might be bothering the robin. And they were picking up the ants and tucking them in among their feathers so that they could eat. It was amazing. I've never seen that. Wow. Were those red ants then? Or yeah, they were red ants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. Thank you. You're I understand they're after the formic acid that the uh, that the ants produce, and then it um, it's kind of like an insect, you know, insecticidal soap for them, like for the mites that they get and things like that. Yeah, it was incredible. I'm sure the ants must bite too. We have uh, another question on ants from Susanna Michaelis. Um, Susanna, do you want to? Yeah, that spurred a question. What about those pavement ants? Apparently they've come into a, a, a home of a neighbor and they're in the walls and there's bits of like sawdust all along the walls. Uh, have you heard of pavement ants coming indoors? At least that's what we're thinking they are. Um, I haven't heard of pavement ants coming indoors. I don't know if they would or not. They're an introduced species um, and uh, they probably just can make their home anywhere they want. But to do, to make a pile of sawdust sounds more like a carpenter ant because they don't, carpenter ants don't eat wood, but they can chew it to make holes through it. And right. so that sounds more like carpenter ant than it does pavement ant. Yeah, apparently they've been identified as some not carpenter ants, so huh. we're, ca we're calling them pavement ants, but I, maybe there's <laughs> another special name for them. <laughs> maybe, and you could always do the borax. It works on all ants. So Nikki, right. there's about yeah. three minutes left before we wrap up. So I think, um, Dave, what, what remains is, is we've got a wealth of knowledge here, and um, maybe you could just ask Sabine first to talk about what she can offer on native plants for lawns and Carolyn's advice on, on controlling wasps. But maybe Sabine, if you oh. want to introduce yourself. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Oh, 
Okay. Uh, yes, I, uh, I'm in Duncan and um, I have worked on my lawn, uh, on my property since we bought it in 2016. I would say I started uh, working with native plants, introducing them um, half a year later. And I have now uh, eliminated practically all lawn except uh, around my veggie beds and uh, I have um, introduced lots and lots of native plants. It's a small place, there was no tree and I, I'm regretful that there aren't any large structures but I have learned a, a great deal during these um, years and I have a really beautiful thriving habitat for lots of native bees, snakes, garter snakes. Um, um, I don't know if I have salamanders. I have a wee wetland, a tiny, tiny wetland. But in any case, I wanted to offer uh, people who may be interested in turning their lawns into wildlife habitat I, I would be happy to help if there are questions how to do this um, and um, you know avoid mistakes also on the uh, selection of native plants that you plant instead. Um, it's not so easy. It's I mean it's not rocket science, but one can put a lot of um, time and effort into something and then discover that it didn't work. So I'm happy to help anyone who is um, who is interested, Thanks. So, if so, I can. So Sabine, that's a wonderful offer. And one of our roles here in the Yellow Point Ecological Society is to sort of connect people together and help each other. So if you'd like to write a blog for us, we can put it on our website, we can share it with all our members, and then they can reach out to you individually if they want to come and see your place once we're out of this COVID thing and learn from you and you can share your wisdom around, right? I see. Well, I have hadn't contemplated uh, writing a blog, but yeah, it, it, it blog is easy. It's, it's, it's imagine you're writing a letter to your favorite aunt. It's just very easy, chatty language, and then we can share your well, your knowledge, really. Ah, okay. Yeah, that may be a good thing. Uh, in the meantime, uh, in the chat, I have mentioned my email address and my right. phone number. So if anyone wants to um, contact me. You know, I'm not an expert. I don't claim to be a super expert, yeah. nowhere like what, I mean, Claudia is really uh, amazing, but I would be happy to share my experiences and it's for free, of course. Okay, good, thank so, you. Yeah. Hey, Nikki, any wrap up comments at your end before we begin to wind up? Um, uh, there, there's other advice out there on the, on the, on the so notes let's, there. Let's, like, Carolyn was offering advice on, um, wasps and uh, but yeah. I don't know if you want to so let's I think it's 8 30 I think we should wrap up now yeah. I want yeah. to do that I want you to in, in the top right hand corner of your screen you can it, if you go to view gallery and open up your cameras so that we can see you all and let's all give Claudia a big big thank you together <laughs> Yay. That's cute. Very cute. Your, your life experience, your knowledge, uh, yeah, yeah. your your absolutely um, clear love of all this stuff is just um, yeah. infectious, and it's wonderful for all of us. Uh, you're going to make a big difference for us all. So thank you so much for sharing this with you. We have been recording this. It will be. It'll take me a couple of days, but I will send a copy of the link to all of you so that you can then show it to everyone else and pass it around with everyone. So. And um, we'll be having another evening in about two weeks time with actually people from the Coxsila working group talking about the difference between the ecosystem challenges down in the Coxsila watershed in Shawnigan with what we've got up here. So we'll be sending you information on that. Meanwhile, thanks again, Claudia. Thanks for a great evening, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the night. Thank you. Thanks. And don't and go have, have a submarine sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've got to mention the submarines. Claudia, last words to you. Last yeah, I was just going to say, don't hesitate to send me your photos of things you don't know what they are or your questions. I'm happy to help with that if I can. And I and I have access to experts in different fields. So sometimes, you know, we just enlist somebody who knows more. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye